Welcome everyone to this afternoon's event. Uh, my name's Steve Brammer, I'm the Dean of the School of Management and it's a real pleasure to welcome you all to the fourth of this season's School of Management book series. Our book series, as you will know, many of you have attended multiple of these, is a, is a series of events in which we celebrate and explore recent books written by members of the School of Management community. The events give us an opportunity to hear from leading experts about their books and provide audiences with an opportunity to pose questions and engage directly with books authors. It's lovely to see so many of you here for this afternoon's events. Today, I'm delighted to welcome a wonderful colleague, Professor Margaret Heffernan, to talk about her book, Uncharted, How Uncertainty Can Power Change. Let me just say a few words of introduction and welcome to Margaret. Uh, as well as being an all-round whirlwind and force of nature, uh, Professor Margaret Heffernan is Professor of Practice here in the School of Management at the University of Bath. She's also lead faculty for the Forward Institute's Responsible Leadership Programme, and she chairs the boards of DAX and Film Bath and is a trustee of the Centre for Effective Dispute Resolution. Through American Co, Margaret also mentors CEOs and senior executives at major global organisations. Dr. Margaret Heffernan produced programmes for the BBC for 13 years. She then moved on to the US where she spearheaded multimedia productions for Intuit, The Learning Company and Standard & Poor's. She was Chief Executive of Information Corporation, Zine Zone Corporation and then ICAST and was named one of the top 25 by Streaming Media Magazine and one of the top 100 media executives by The Hollywood Reporter. The author of six books, Margaret's third book, Willful Blindness, Why We Ignore the Obvious at Our Peril, was named one of the most important business books of the decade by the Financial Times. And in 2015, she was awarded the Transform Transmission Prize uh, for a bigger prize, Why Competition Isn't Everything and How We Do Better. Described as meticulously researched, engagingly written, universally relevant and hard to fault. Her TED Talks have been seen by over 13 million people around the world uh, and uh, published beyond measure the big impact of small changes. Today we talk about Uncharted, how uncertainty can power change, now available in all good bookstore uh, and all uh, digital providers. Welcome, Margaret. It's an enormous pleasure to have an opportunity for a conversation this afternoon. Hey, Steve. It's really nice to be together. So first up, I'm often intrigued as I talk to authors about a number of books about, about where the book came from, uh, what motivated you to write it, you know, how, how does it fit within your canon, if you like, and, and who's the book targeted at? Yeah, well, it's a very good question. Um, all of my books really start with questions that I don't know the answer to, and they nag me, and they nag me until eventually they turn into some kind of book. Um, but it's interesting because I remember many years ago, probably 2015, doing an event at Bath with the then vice chancellor about my book, A Bigger Prize. And at the end of it, my husband came up to me and he said, you know, I think you're writing a trilogy. And I said, oh, really? What's the, what's the third volume? <laughs> Unfortunately, he didn't know. And it took me quite a while to figure out for myself. Um, but I, this book started with some very, very random things. I remember once picking my daughter up from a friend's house and the, the friend's mother said to me, you know, if I knew I was going to live to be 100, I'd drink more. And I thought this was wildly funny. Nobody else seemed to think it was very funny. I thought it was wildly funny because, of course, if she drank more, she wouldn't live to be 100. And it just stuck in my head as emblematic of how there's very weird and magical ways in which we think about the future. And then, you know, the, I think kind of frankly notorious Oxford Martin study came out about what was it, you know, 38% of jobs were going to disappear by 2035. And everybody got all wildly excited. And I remember looking at that and thinking, well, this is ridiculous. You know, you can't get that kind of granular data over such a long time period. And um, and everybody got started talking about it. And then I, you know, I, I read the paper and the first line of which is pretty much, you know, we're trying out a new model, which means we have the faintest idea this stuff's real or not. But hey, it turned out to be great PR for Oxford Martin, for the authors. And this completely spurious data point, so-called data point, is still out there. I still hear, you know, respectable firms quoting it. And I thought, well, this is just nonsense. 
And because, you know, I worked in the tech sector for a long time and still do, I mean, I just saw all the kind of complete nonsense around AI and self-driving cars and thought, okay, there's some, something going on here. And I think the kind of the thing that really nailed the thesis for me was reading Philip Tetlock's work, which I've read for years, um, you know, where he said he really reckoned that the window for accurate forecasting these days if you're super rigorous and you consult a very broad range of sources, you assign probabilities to your forecasts and you're constantly tweaking that probability. And then when the event happens or doesn't happen, you go back and see what you got right and got wrong. If you're that rigorous, probably the horizon for accurate forecasting is about 400 days. And if like the rest of us, you're not quite so rigorous, it's closer to 150 days. And I thought, hang on a second, the whole premise of modern management is forecast, plan, execute. It's a sort of three-legged stool. Well, if the first leg doesn't work, the whole thing doesn't work. And, you know, and then I spent some time thinking, am I the only person who's, who's seen this? I mean, why is everybody going on as if life is normal? Life is not normal. And that's really when the book started, you know, standing up and banging on my face to be written. Mm. Fantastic, thanks. And, and certainly life is not normal and hasn't been normal for quite some time. So, but so it's amazing. It is amazing how nobody wanted to hear it. Yeah, no, I, 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 can, I can well imagine that, given all sorts of difficulties, some, some of which we'll touch upon. So, so you, you touched upon, you used the word then thesis. So, so share with us, if you would, the thesis of Uncharted. What, what's the big idea in a nutshell of the book? Sure. Well, the first third of the book is, I think, a pretty um, comprehensive takedown of the ways in which we traditionally think about the future. Mm. Economic models don't work. History doesn't repeat itself. Your genes will not decide or tell you what you're going to be when you grow up. And it's in the nature of complexity that um, we almost always have to make decisions before all the data's in. And so we have to make models, but the hot salient fact about models is they leave stuff out. So we can't predict, and we just need to get our heads around this. And then, And it's not gonna get better anytime soon. So the rest of the book, which is, uh, you know, a pretty op optimistic book, is really saying, well, in that case, what do we do? We can't just sit here frozen and we can't wait till all the data's in. There's stuff that needs to be done. Um, so what are the different ways we should start thinking and acting and living and working? Yeah, I think I think that's really a, fa a fantastic summary. Y you make, I think, a number of times through the book as you, as you traverse various issues, I think a really powerful distinction between problems and issues that one might describe as complicated versus mm. those that are complex. And Uncharted really is is a a thesis and a worldview about the complex. Can you say a bit more, uh, perhaps with the odd example about what the difference is between the complicated and the complex and why that matters quite so much? Yeah, sure, it really matters because if you can't tell the difference, you start applying the, set, the wrong methods to a problem. So, you know, on a simple level, and, and once upon a time when we used to fly places, you know, we'd go to the airport, we would check in, we'd have, you know, check our bags if we had one, We'd get onto the plane, there would be food and drink and stuff on the plane. All of that was very complicated. Multiple vendors, multiple businesses interacting with each other, lots of moving pieces, but basically the same thing every single, single, single time. So that meant it was, you know, you could see all the actors in it. You could absolutely optimize for efficiency. Once the plane takes off, you're in a very different world because you're up, you know, above the earth, there are all sorts of things you can't predict. And, um, and as, a as a consequence, you're in a complex environment, you can't influence it really. You can't say, no, please don't send the thunderstorm right now, for example, you can, you know, with navigation, you can try to circumvent it, but you don't know if there's a geese strike heading your way. And by the time you do know, it's too late. And the consequence of that is, 
that um, you know, airplanes are designed to have more engines than they need. They're designed to have more operating systems than they need. And this is expensive. It means more maintenance. You know, it means more moving parts. But you do that because you know you don't know and you know you can't control what's happening. That's a characteristic of a complex environment. There are too many things acting on too many things. And even if you can influence one, you can't be confident that you see all of them. There's wild variability and things change so often that expertise that often won't help you. And in this environment, efficiency is a catastrophe, right? So you do robust engineering so that you can get through it. And even though it's gonna cost you a lot. Now, so that's kind of, you know, a, a, an illustration of the difference. In real life, um, you see in what looks like one thing, two different modes of operating. So for example, I grew up in the Netherlands um, and the Dutch healthcare system relies enormously on home care nursing because it's very well understood that when you come out of hospital, people get better very much faster mentally and physically at home. It's cheaper, it's safer, it's generally cleaner and so on and so forth. So you want people to be at home and the Dutch healthcare system sends a lot of people to people's homes to look after them there. Now it used to be run very much as it is today in the UK, an industrialized model of medicine. So the insurance triggers the contract, which triggers the, the assignment of the nurse to the patient. That triggers a schedule, which is, you know, visit this patient Monday on, on um, you know, in the morning for five minutes, Wednesday for seven minutes and Friday for eight minutes. And it's all kind of planned out in advance for maximum efficiency of resources. Hmm. Now, there are a couple problems with this system. One is it's monstrously expensive to run, huge amounts of bureaucracy behind it. Secondly, the patients hate it because they're just being treated like they're on an assembly line. And the nurses hated it too, because they're just you know robots in the assembly line. So it's a miserable system. And there's a really brilliant guy named Josterblok who unusually has trained as an economist, but then went to work as a nurse. And he stopped being an economist because he thought that was miserable. And then he became a nurse and that was miserable. <laughs> and then he put these two ways of thinking together and thought, hang on a second. There's a different way. There's a better way to think about this. And what he saw is a really brilliant insight. All that kind of contractual stuff, you know, the, the, uh, sorting out the health insurance, which they have in, in, in Holland, and doing invoices and, and that sort of stuff. That's quite easy to automate. It's a complicated system and therefore very well optimized by efficiency, which is generally what technology gives you. Mm. But the thing about the patients is no two patients are the same. And, you know, you and I can come out of the same hospital having broken the same leg at the same time, and our recovery rates will be different because we're different people in different environments. And there are all sorts of things influencing our recovery rate that no healthcare system on earth knows anything about. So that's complex. So he said, so divide the way that they're run. You automate the bureaucratic stuff. And then in terms of patient care, Get rid of all the bureaucratic mumbo jumbo and say to the nurses, do what's right for the patient. Mm -hmm. Now, this has been, you know, looked at as a kind of radical example of, of freedom and self-management, which you can say it is. Actually, I think it's a really brilliant analysis of why we have two competing systems often in organizations that just don't get along because they're all being treated as if they're complicated, highly rules bound, too many manuals, and everybody hates them because they're trying to standardize what isn't standard. Anyway, when they did a, an experiment, what they discovered was that if you separated these things and ran this as Joste Block's um, concept was, the cost of providing healthcare to these patients at home fell by 30% because the patients got better in half the time. Now, this is not something any efficiency expert would ever have figured out. You're not gonna figure it out on a spreadsheet or a model. It's now absolutely taken over in the Netherlands, in Taiwan, 
uh, in Japan, in parts of the United States, is there's a fierce battle going on trying to shoehorn it into the NHS, where I would say an old fashioned bureaucratic, efficiency minded, complicated mindset simply can't cope with it. Yeah, I mean, as a former economist, I'm, I'm struck by the transition from economist to nurse. I think that's a particularly interesting transition, isn't it? Um, you know, in your terms, the first the first part of the book is, uh, and I agree, it's a really searching analysis, a takedown of, of these alternative ways of, you know, the sort of snake oil salesmen who, who tell you that they can, they can, you know, forecast the future. I employ a lot of these kinds of people these days, you know, as, as business schools do, you know, my, our analytics and forecasting group grows uh, monthly, it feels. You know, can you say a bit more about what the limitations of uh, the technological hope to be able to know more about the future looks like you know as i say there's a lot of increasingly sophisticated data analytics out there share a little bit of your thinking around why it is we can't expect it to ai machine learning you know big data etc 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 to give us a much better handle on the future well you know let me be clear i don't think this stuff is useless but i think the propaganda with which we're being sold it is dangerous um, a, because it is hugely persuading people that they just can't think for themselves, um, which is super dangerous. Um, but it's also being promoted with no caveats. So, you know, so you have apps saying we can predict, you know, you can, if you follow what the app says, your child will grow up basically to win a Nobel Prize. Well, I mean, this is ridiculous. Um, you know, the, I mean, I think Google first announced it would have self-driving cars, you know, available for people in 2017 and then 18 and 19 and so on. So this is all being marketed with a, a kind of propaganda of inevitability, which is primarily aimed at legislators to get all the legislative give required um, to make this a market because it's, you know, the automotive market is really the biggest manufacturing market in America. Um, so a lot of it is driven by an agenda that is highly self-interested and not terribly fond of self-disclosure. So that's part of the problem. There's also a problem that all models are based on assumptions. You know, you can't have a model as big as the world. So you have to decide what goes in and what goes out. And what you generally decide is the stuff that you think is important, but it may not be actually what's most important, or it may not be what everybody thinks is important. There's a really beautiful example of this, I think when Philadelphia started using a predictive model of which families would need um, social care for their children. And they built this huge model based on all the sort of social services data that they had. Well, there's a huge problem around that for several reasons. One is because they only had their data which means they only had data from particularly deprived families. Mm -hmm. They had no data about um, social services need in families that could afford to buy it privately. So this is a deeply, deeply skewed model of human behavior. In addition, what it meant was that, you know, that the families who had kind of more demand on the system, their children were deemed to be at greater risk. That's a bit of a problem because the 16 year old who may have a file as big as the world um, may not be in great danger if he's locked out of his house on a cold night, whereas a toddler will be, even though he may have no file at all. So it's absolutely jam packed full of assumptions, these sorts of systems, which you know, would be kind to say you learn the hard way. That's one of the problems. They are ideologically or ideological. I mean, you know, the, the economist Paul Krugman says this, you know, beautiful blow away, throw away comment he came out with once, you know. I sometimes think the data that didn't make it into my models might have been more important than the data that did. Mm -hmm. so, so they're not unhelpful, but anybody who takes them for the gospel truth, which is generally how they're sold, is really in trouble. You know, because they're self-interested, they are definitely biased. All of the data isn't in there. 
very incomplete data sets. And you know, the really good news is that there is a formidable movement getting ahead of steam to start looking at how do you audit AI, uh, hugely led by the wonderful, delightful mathematician, Kathy O'Neill. And for a long time, of course, AI was covered as a trade secret. So you couldn't find out, for example, why the software, which tended to throw out, it was software for hiring people in fast food joints, right? Which has a tur staff employment turnover in the service area of about 200% per year. So super expensive process and you want to kind of speed it up somehow. Um, so they brought in software to do that is predictive modeling who are going to be the good candidates. And the stuff for some reason threw out only people who had some indication somewhere perhaps of a past history of mental health. Mm -hmm. Now in the United States under the Americans with Disabilities Act, this is against the law. You can't do this in an interview, but apparently you can do it with software. And the software is covered as a trade secret. Mm -hmm. And so it's really great that there is this whole movement about social AI and auditing AI to look at who these systems are harming. Because you can figure that out without actually having to take the trade secret apart. Um, but I think what it means is that as much as this, you know, multi-billion dollar propaganda industry is persuading us that, oh no, tech knows everything, sit down, chill out, watch TV, you don't need to think anymore. The reality is we have to think more carefully and more astutely than ever if we're not going to be sold an ideological myth um, which seeks to make simple what is not. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a really powerful point. One might be slightly downcast about the complexity of the world that we face. And one of the things I was struck by in Uncharted is, is a number of times a number of themes really say, actually, don't be as despondent as that. Be optimistic about and confident and, and in a sense kind of, um, you know, there's something empowering about the fact that the world is complex if you take it, if you view it in a certain way. Can you say a little bit about how, if we can't predict at least at decent levels of range, you know, what are the sources of optimism? How should we as individuals and organisations approach the, uh, the complexity that we're faced with? Yeah. Well, I think the first thing is, you know, is, is don't, don't, don't fall for the snake oil. And don't let the whole kind of rhetoric around prediction and uh, behaviorism persuade you that you know you really can't figure this out for yourself. That's the first thing. I think the second thing is we have to appreciate that actually human beings through history have been quite good at adapting and figuring stuff out for themselves. But a lot of that requires a creative capacity. And that means a use of imagination. That means being able to explore and wonder. It also means having the imagination to concoct uh, experiments like the um, experiment that Josta Block conducted, where you kind of poke the system to see, well, if we did it a different way, how would that work? And, you know, this is kind of thinking in action. And I think what's really striking is that you know, whether I was looking at things like the Dutch healthcare system or things like democratic experiments, such as we saw in Ireland with the Citizens Assembly, or whether you go as I did to CERN and look at how do people figure out how to do, how to invent the machinery to enable you to do an experiment of, in search of something which you don't even know exists. I mean, this is the far, far, far edge of uncertainty. And yet they can do it. So the first thing I would say is, you know, look at these fantastic examples and don't lose heart. Think very hard about the kind of mechanisms and processes you need to amplify the creativity and imaginative capacity of your people. Create an environment in which this is part of the work where actually, you know, the advantage of some of the technologies we have now is we can get rid of the complicated, tedious stuff, but that's only valuable if we put a lot more effort into the complex stuff, which is hugely demanding of our creativity, inventiveness, and our capacity to collaborate. 
And that I think we can do, and the book is jam packed full of examples, but we can't do it if we remain attached to an obsession with efficiency. Because if you want to understand where you are in a very complex environment, you have to do experiments before you absolutely need to. And you have to start thinking about preparedness as well as planning. Now, in terms of experiments, you know, I think one of the things that's really interesting here is that we could have done experiments on flexible working 15 years ago. Why didn't we? Well, I suspect partly because people had ideas that flexible working was code for slacking. You had a lot of sort of theory X, theory Y arguments about or did people really just come into work to skive off? Um, but also there's a sort of efficiency mindset that said, well, if we don't need to do it, why should we do it? If we had done it, we'd have been a much, much better place than the kind of traumatic scramble everybody had to go through for during months of which people were cooped up in tiny bedrooms working alone all day. And we might have got our heads around the mental health issues a lot better and therefore have been better prepared. So I think one way that you cope with complexity and uncertainty, you do experiments all the time trying to figure out are there better ways to be doing what we're doing? Are there more productive ways to be doing what we're doing? And that's business as usual. It's not a crisis and it's not a, it's not a pilot. It's genuine exploration and poking of the system that you're in and that you're part of to see, let's see if there's a better way. So I think you have to do that. And then I think you have to think about preparedness. And this comes back to this notion of robustness. We have to, I mean, we're certainly in a position now where we cannot avoid thinking about the crises we are heading into. And instead of waiting for them to come and whack us over the head, start thinking about which are those with highest likelihood and highest impact. Now, one of the really great things, I think, is that in 2017, some very clever people at the Wellcome Trust, well, actually, they were thinking about this 2015, if I'm fair, came back from the most recent Ebola epidemic, where for the first time in history, they had been able to trial a vaccine in the middle of an epidemic and it worked. And they came back and they said, okay, in an epidemic, a vaccine is the holy grail. So what are the diseases with high impact and high likelihood, given that epidemics are always happening? And we know we can't predict them because there's no profile for an epidemic, right? They're, they always happen but we don't know when, we don't know where they start, we don't know what the pathogen will be. So that being the case, what are the high profile, high impact, high likelihood diseases for which we could start developing uh, vaccines now? And God bless them, they identified six, they got the money, England didn't sign up for this, sadly, um, but the Gates Foundation did and a whole bunch of other countries did. And they started developing vaccine platforms. And the vaccine platform on which Moderna is based is one of those platforms. Now they called this the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness. They launched it at Davos in 2017. The UK joined in 2020. Um, but this is great thinking. I mean, this is absolute leadership thinking. High likelihood, high impact, start now. Now, last week, I wrote a piece for the Financial Times on the back of a survey of, P of global CEOs that show only 22% have any kind of plan to reach net zero. 57% don't think that their company has carbon emissions. I mean, this is a catastrophic failure. And this is what happens when you think you can predict the future and you think that efficiency is everything. You cannot, in that mindset, spend to get ahead of the problem. And that's you know, part of why I think our whole way of thinking about the future has really put us in very grave peril today. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think I think powerful stuff. I, I was intrigued by by what you just um, said about the role of leaders and leaderships in mm. uncharted futures. And I wonder whether you could say a little bit about how you think, because I know, you know, much of your writing has been a reflection in some ways on leaders and leadership and, and their roles. I wonder, I wonder whether you could share some of your thinking around you know, what the roles and responsibilities of leaders and leadership are through uh, uncharted environments? Well, I think the key is kind of in the word, you know, which is the job of leadership is to lead, which is to be ahead. Mm. Um, sadly, I think we live in an age where most of our leaders would rather kind of hang out with the crowd, no matter what the crowd is. Um, so it's a, you know, pretty stunning absence of leadership. It's quite hard these days to name people who are really taking a lead as far as sustainability is concerned. And it's always the same handful of companies. Um, so I think, you know, I think in leadership, I think there are a couple of things that become really important. One is understanding the difference between complicated and complex. One is understanding that therefore the kind of industrial revolution model of management which is forecast, plan, execute, and execute, optimize for efficiency is way past its sell-by date. It'll solve some problem, but it won't solve your biggest problems. I think it requires a level of courage in terms of being honest and educating investors and consumers about what that actually means, instead of kind of hoping that somebody else will go first. Um, but I think it also means that in a, in a situation as complex as the one we're in now, there is no leader and there is no leadership team that can know enough. And so I think increasingly the job of leadership is to ask the right questions and convene the right people. And by that, I don't mean an elite of strategic thinkers. Um, I don't read very many business books, but one of the ones that's really captured my attention is written by, you know, somebody I met at the University of Bath, right, Christian Stadler, who's now um, at Warwick, a book he's written with some colleagues on open strategy, which basically says, you know, there's strategic thinking all over your organization. Why aren't you using it? If you really want to get a multiple perspective on what's going on out there. You need to talk to the people who are out there. And it's a very practical book. It's very down to earth. Um, it clearly resonates with people uh, like myself who care deeply about democratic values within business. Um, but I think what it speaks to is the need to involve more people in strategic thinking definitely not just outsourcing it to people who don't, aren't gonna to have to live with the consequences. Um, but also it speaks to something really, I think of increasing importance, which is as we are going through an age of crises to which at the moment, nobody can see an end. The decisions that leaders are going to make, obviously, you know, you have, they have to be sound and they have to be based on valid information and so on. But actually, if they're gonna work, they have to be deemed to be legitimate. And the process by which they are developed, therefore, has to be seen to be legitimate, which means it can't come out of a kit, a tin labeled McKinsey, and it can't just come out of the heads of a couple of guys, and it mostly is guys, who went off to a swanky hotel for a weekend and cooked it up. So I think this is a very different kind of leadership. It's going to require a, you know, a huge capacity to listen, a huge capacity to ask bold questions, um, a huge capacity to reflect creatively on, you know, what, how do we make sense of all the stuff we hear about, and the capacity of many people on many levels to step up and take ownership for their ideas. So this is really, really different. And, um, you know, I think the jury's out whether we can adapt in time to develop the kind of leadership we need to respond in time to the stuff that's heading our way. 
Yeah, I, I, I absolutely agree. I mean, it struck me as I read the book. I mean, a lot of the analysis I, I can really see resonating with individuals and with organisations who are thinking about how... Um, how we might approach the sort of uncertain environments, complex environments we face. But I was also struck by, at a variety of points, the profound implications of complexity for society as a sort of larger entity, if you like. You know, you think about trust and confidence in democracy, which you touch on uh, a couple of times and we've touched on today. It feels to me complexity is really undermining uh, trust and confidence in democratic institutions, for example. Uh, it also seems to me we've had a, something of a loss of uh, community and solidarity in the face of um, uh, in the face of that complexity. I wonder what your thinking is around, in a sense, how we as a society might um, uh, approach these complex, uncertain environments. You know, we've talked a bit about leaders. What's the, in a sense, what, what's our obligation as, as stakeholders in society in relation to those same kind of uncertainties? Yeah. Well, I mean, we may not like complexity, but we can't get rid of it. Right. So we're kind of stuck with it. So we have to think more clearly about how we respond to it and what's, what we lead people to expect from us. Mm. And I think, I mean, my own view is we have brought people up to think that to every question there is a right answer. It's absolutely how our education system works for a long time. And that's unhelpful um, because to many, many questions, there are many, many, many answers. And if we leave it until pretty much a master's program before we start kind of digging, digging into complexity and uncertainty, I think that's too late. Um, I think we need to be, a yeah, I think we need to teach some of the skills, which are largely creative skills, um, more comprehensively with more seriousness in primary and secondary school. So I think our the present government's allergy to the arts is not only uninformed, but really dangerous um, because we're going to need creative solutions, you know, by the bucket full. Um, I think that we need to help people learn better how to do multiple perspective taking. You know, and one reason I'm so delighted to be at Bath is because I get to teach my Giving Voice to Values pro you know, uh, program, which is absolutely about this, absolutely about seeing a problem from multiple angles and understanding what's really going on within it. And as a consequence, it was, it's really hard. Um, but it's really, really important to be able to see who are all the players here and how do we reconcile these very difficult problems. Mm. Um, so I think we have to do that. And I think we have to get very, very comfortable with the idea that there is no recipe and we have to try stuff and work from what we learn. You know, one reason I said earlier, I don't read very many business books is most business books offer a recipe, do the following five things and you will be golden. Um, and I remember when I was running my tech companies in the US and I was desperate to figure out how do I solve this problem and that problem and that problem. And I'd read these damn things and I think, well, that doesn't help me at all. It's just completely unrealistic. You know, these people haven't so much as run a lemonade stand. It's ridiculous. So I think we have to start. I mean, one reason I write the way I do, which drives my editor mad, is because I want to write about business like life because it is life. Mm. It isn't done in a laboratory. It isn't a controlled experiment. No two day, days in business are the same. No two companies are the same. No two customers are the same. So we have to start kind of getting our head, hands around this and, and thinking about more adaptive, flexible, creative thinking for dealing with it instead of trying to force fit it into models that then break down. 
Yeah, I think that's very wise. As you say, you know, re recipe based, you know, the five ways to X or Y or Z, I think uh, it's, a, it's a depressing kind of read in many ways, isn't it? Yeah. And certainly, I think your, I think Uncharted comes across as, as a sort of more authentic, if, you know, because of that naturally more challenging kind of uh, di dialogue with the reader, which I think is, is very interesting. We'll turn over then now to, to uh, engagement with the group. I'll start with uh, a question from Lani. And Lani asks, um, you speak of the power of uh, the potential for human interaction that has never been greater or more needed. How do we take our power back? Meaning using our innate human gifts, direct connection, communication, compassion, face-to-face, -face, relationship-based, uh, she says, I'm constantly fighting the tsunami of technology as victory rather than using it as a tool and putting the strength of our human gifts first. So it's about our agency and how we find our place in this in this uncertain context and move forward. Yeah, well, I think I mean, it's a great question. I really sympathize with the struggle, but I think we have power. We have just stopped using it. And I remember, I you know, I was really struggling with something. I'm trying to remember what what program I was working on. Um, it may have been the sustainability startup challenge that we're doing in June. And I was struggling with teams, which I think is probably everybody's nightmare and, you know, trying to figure stuff out. And I couldn't for the life of me figure out the university timetable. And I was just going berserk. And, um, and I've been working with a woman who as, by pure chance uh, lives in the next village to me. And I just phoned her up. This is the wonderful Sarah Peel. And I said, can I just cycle over and can you explain this to me? And God bless her. We had a cup of tea. I brought some biscuits and she walked me through it. I could have wasted the whole day beating my head against the brick wall that is teams. So, you know, that was my choice. Nobody told me to do that. I just thought this can't be this difficult, you know, <laughs> and it wasn't that difficult. So I think we have to make the choices here. I mean, I think we also have to lift our voices when we feel that things are being automated that shouldn't be automated, or things are being done remotely that perhaps shouldn't be done remotely, or when we're being told that things can be done hybrid when really almost nothing can be done well hybrid unless we buy a lot more equipment. But I think we have to take our stand. Nobody's going to give this power back to us. We either surrender it or we use it. Yeah, absolutely. Don asks a question. Don Lancaster asks a question about, about um, the behemoth. So massive data, AI, consequent models of modeling rest largely in the hands of the Microsoft, Apple's, Alphabet, Meta, Amazon, etc. of the world. And he asks, do you find this reassuring or terrifying and why? Oh, it's absolutely terrifying. I mean, um, anybody who hasn't read Shoshana Zuboff's book on the rise of surveillance capitalism has to because what she's done is she's figured out that we may think this is a technical, you know, this is a technology problem. Mm. It's not a technology problem. It's a problem inherent to capitalism. And we've got to understand that. It isn't about is Satya and Nadella a nicer guy than Mark Zuckerberg? Yes, he's a much nicer guy than Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> that is not the point. You can't put Satya Nadella in charge of Facebook and everything's gonna be rosy. So it's not that, it is scale. And I wrote about this in a bigger prize. It is in the nature of capitalism that it won't stop till it breaks. So it will keep breaking. And until we get our heads around that and understand that these, any of these kinds of businesses need limits, they will keep breaking. They will seduce us to depend on them and then they will break and they will let us down. And we see this in every conceivable industry. And we have to start having a, a grown up conversation about this. It isn't just tech. You know, the fact that we are dealing with a massive loss in biodiversity isn't tech, right? I mean, you could say it's biotech, but you know, it's not, it's because our the, in a capitalist system, companies won't stop making money by 
good means and bad until you stop them and put some boundaries around them. This is the nature of the beast. It is like a dog that will eat itself to death. And we've got to come to terms with that. I mean, she, you know, I, I feel really unhappy that Shoshana's book is so long because it puts everybody off it. And I think she made a big, bad decision when she refused to cut it. But I think it's the most important book, apart from my own, of course, that, you know, that, that people need to be reading today. Because again, it comes back to this thing about, you know, power and tech. We have the power. We are choosing at the moment not to use it. Monia asks, I think, a really intriguing question um, uh, around uh, the capacities of different kinds of organizations to kind of embrace the experiment, be creative, scenario plan, think outside your traditional kind of frames kind of approach. And she says many organizations are resource constrained, SMEs, public sector organizations and so on. How can companies create capacity, space for creativity and reflection under those conditions? Large organizations have that. It seems fairly straightforward how they might pick up the lessons in Uncharted and run them forward. What about other kinds of organizations? What would you say to a dean of a school of management, for example, Margaret, you know, about how we embrace the Uncharted way? Yeah. Well, I think, first of all, isn't it interesting that often it's the companies that are most constrained that are most um, creative, mm. right? Why do people go and work in startups? Because there's no money, you know, there's no perks, there's no certainty, and they're a hell of a lot of fun. What is it that makes it fun? The close relationships between people and the sense of shared mission, vision, daring, adventure. I mean, equally, I would say in public sector, you know, there's a story in my book about um, a guy named Oliver Burroughs, who was chief data officer at the Bank of England. And even though the Bank of England is the Bank of England, you know, it is a public institution that is slightly, strangely enough, not awash with their own money, right? And uh, so very, very resource constrained. And, you know, Oliver realized that because of more and more regulation around financial services, there was going to be a far greater demand, uh, both for data and data analysis. And as chief data officer, He's also grown up enough to know that nobody was going to give him any more resources. So this is, you know, like facing a tsunami and you don't even have your swimming trunks on. So he thought, you know, he was tempted at first to do what everybody does, right? Take your senior leadership team away and to the swanky hotel and org charts and budgets and stuff and rearrange. And instead he did a really beautiful experiment. He just brought everybody together and said, okay, this is where we are. And uh, we're somehow going to have to find some way wildly to increase our own productivity. And I'm not going to be the person who's just going to tell everybody to work harder. Mm -hmm. So I need everybody's ideas. Now that in itself was an experiment and everybody, you know, a lot of his peers in the bank told him he was really playing with fire. But he said he got this, I'm very surprised by the number of suggestions he got for experiments. Um, some of them were complete washouts. Like one, somebody said, well, we should all be able to come to the senior leadership team meeting because we never know what goes on in there and it leads to lots of gossip and uncertainty. So they threw the doors open, people turned up, discovered it was really quite tedious um, and they stopped coming. No big productivity savings there. Someone else said, we need radically to redesign our annual appraisal process. It's dead, boring, nobody believes it. It's a total waste of time, effort and money. And so they put, you know, did a kind of mini hackathon and came up with something that people really feel mat matters to them. It really speaks to their professional development. It's really credible and it's led to much, much higher levels of engagement. Um, some engineers in data coding said, you know, I think if we coded the data differently and it would speed things up. So they took a sample batch and tried that and found a 10X improvement. Something which Oliver said to me, nobody in the senior leadership would, team would ever have even known to do. They're too far from the action. You know, and as Gary Hamill says, it's well known in management that there's far more knowledge at the edge than at the center. So you're drawing in all this information from the, from the edge to be able to figure out where, is, where there's capacity. And what Oliver said to me was, you know, the thing that was the big experiment was doing the experiment. 
not knowing if it would deliver, which it really did. But also he said, I really used to think that strategy was just something for the higher ups. And I realized that actually there was really good thinking at every level of the organization. So there's an example of a public institution without massive resources, still finding within quite a very traditional hierarchy, the capacity to find some flexibility inside itself. So I think it's I think it's doable. And I think, you know, most of the stuff I'm writing about, you know, it's it doesn't require gigantic resources. It requires gigantic amounts of, ima of imagination and creativity and debate and conflict and thinking and reflection. Yeah. But, you know, you've got a school packed full of smart people who are good at all that stuff. That is true. That is true. I do. James asks uh, a really intriguing question, I think, which is about how you will evaluate the success of Uncharted. So he asks, you know, when you look back in 12 months time, what, what, what does success look yeah. like for you in Uncharted? Well, it's really interesting. Um, I mean, I remember when Willful Blindness came out. And after about six months, I thought, well, it's a bit of a bust, really. I think it's a wonderful book. Some people think it's a wonderful book. It hadn't really captured the public imagination very well. And then, I think then what happened is it got quoted in a select committee discussion about phone hacking. And then it got nominated for the FT prize. And then it's just gone on to, you know, sell wildly. It is a book with a very, very, very long tail. And I think it's, you know, I regard that book as successful because it has really entered into people's thinking. Um, with Uncharted, I, that book has taken off faster. Um, I think it will remain relevant long, well, as long. Um, but I know this is gonna sound terribly arrogant. I don't really care. I mean, I'm in a really, really fortunate position that I can, I, can, I can and do write what I want to write. I have a phenomenally supportive agent and publishers. And, and I want to write what I think is true. And if people hate it, I'm sorry. But um, I mean, it's interesting because when I was writing a bigger prize every now and then, I would say to my husband, you know, I think this is the longest suicide note in history. People believe in competition more than they believe in God. And I'm writing this whole book saying it doesn't bring out the best in us. What am I thinking? Right? And he said, well, do you believe it? And I said, yes. He said, well, then go back and get back to work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I have maybe some people would call it romantic, but I have an absolute commitment to writing what I think is true and living with the consequences. Mm. And, you know, my husband is an academic and he and I have always had this deal that we will do work we really believe in and live off whatever it makes us, which, you know, sometimes has been, you know, pitifully tiny and sometimes has been a great deal. And, and so that I just care about in terms of the success of the book, did I fudge it or not? And I don't think I fudged it. Yeah, I mean, I would agree. As I said earlier, I think it's certainly a book that's written with intellectual integrity in the sense it doesn't give very, very simple ways for people to think about complex things because they're just that's just not a realistic proposition yeah. that it's fundamental thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, Lucy, last question in, in our last few minutes, then mm -hmm. uh, ask a question that I had on my roster a question. So that's good, uh, which is about what comes next. So uh, Uncharted is the end of the trilogy. Mm -hmm. Tell us a bit about you know, uh, sat here today, what are the issues that are bugging you now that might be the genesis of what you write next? I think, that, I mean, the issue that bugs me now, and it's, it's very much in Uncharted, um, is social resilience and social capital. 
And I was at the Peter Drucker Forum in Vienna earlier, well, I guess last year. And there was a big thing on the future and turbulence and all that jazz. And, and then there was a very last question, which we weren't allowed to answer, which I was very frustrated by, um, which was, you know, amidst all this chaos and mayhem, you know, what on earth can we do to increase our capacity to maybe survive? And um, had I had time to answer, I would have said it's it's absolutely social capital. If we can't build the bonds between people, no amount of technology is gonna save us. And so that's really forefront of my mind. And you know, I'm doing this rather crazy vertically integrated project on um, helping a village get to net zero. And the thing that's coming shouting at me loud and clear is that the process of getting to net zero is the process for building social capital. And it's one reason that draws people into it because they get to know people that they've lived next door to and never talked to. And, and I think that's our, I think that's our best hope. I think it's the thing we need more than anything. Now, you know, World Economic Forum will talk about social cohesion erosion, which is a horrible phrase. Um, but, you know, we have to address this and it's not, it ain't going to be fixed by an app. It's going to be fixed by every conversation we have with every person. Well, that is an extraordinarily positive note on which to end today's session. So thank you very much, Margaret. I'll, I will flash the book again. It's a fantastic book. Genuinely recommend it. You can see all my notes in it. From, from I love it when book. I see the stickies. <laughs> yeah, from for, for my, my reading of the book over the last few weeks. Uh, really enjoyed that. Thank you, everybody, for, uh, for joining us for the conversation today. And to those that have chipped in questions and, and comments, we'll certainly pass those on to, uh, on to Margaret. Um, join us. For our next event. See you all soon. Thanks a lot for joining us. Thanks a lot, Steve.